And when exactly will it get started? I don't know, but it's going to be sometime close to when the RRPs run out, which will be in the next few months. My view is March. The Fed's view is June. It doesn't really matter when. It's coming. Everyone knows it. But nobody at the Fed really knows what's going to happen when it hits. Neither do I, but I'm closer to the truth than they are. Well, hello there, my friends. Rafi here from The End Game Investor with this week's Silver Report for Arcadia Economics. And this week, we're going to get into an internal argument at the Federal Reserve, our favorite central bank, between some governors and some other governors and maybe Jay Powell. They do not understand what happened to about $1.6 trillion. And we're going to explain it to them. It went away because with 5% interest rates plus, you have monetary destruction forces as banks can't make loans, but debt is paid back by borrowers. SLV holdings have reached a new post silver squeeze low as interest in the paper market continues to wane the exact opposite of what we saw during the 2011 bull market top. That is when premiums were negative. For some reason, silver lease rates are at their 2008 great financial crisis highs, and we don't know why. And car prices. People are complaining about car prices. They're too high. But if we look at them in terms of gold, they're down by about an order of magnitude since 1971. So where's the problem? In the car industry or in the money? It's the money. This week's Silver Report is brought to you by Fortuna Silver Mine, symbol FSM. Latest news with Fortuna, and it's a good one, is that they've achieved record production for the quarter as was expected. Vancouver, January 18th, 2024, Fortuna Silver Mine, symbol FSM, reports production results for the fourth quarter and full year 2023 from its five operating mines in Latin America and West Africa. For the full year 2023, Fortuna produced a record 326,638 ounces of gold and 5,883,691 ounces of silver. Oh, by the way, I did the math on that ratio, and it turns out to be about 13 to 1, which is very close to the natural monetary ratio of about 15.5 to 1 in today's modern economy. So where does the 15 to 1 ratio come from? It comes from, among other things, these sorts of statistics, where miners generally mine gold to silver in roughly these quantities. And yes, it changes from mine to mine and from business to business, but overall, it's about 15.5, 16 to 1 or so. For 2023, Gold production and lead production and zinc production all up double digits. Uh, gold significantly 26%, lead up 18%, zinc up 19%, silver down 15%, but I think that had to do with some shutdown of one of the mines due to a labor dispute. So I don't think it's uh, endemic to the company itself. We'll begin with a quick technical note on gold here. We have the gold to GNX ratio. GNX is a production weighted index for commodities. So we have here, we see that the gold to GNX ratio, the higher it is, the more gold is outperforming. We are staying uh, healthfully, healthily above the 200 week moving average here. We've been above the 200 week moving average since uh, around the end of November, it looks like. I think this is week number seven or eight. Uh, and if we look uh, at the past uh, in April, May, June, we did push briefly above the 200 week moving average, but we couldn't stay there. But the last time we bounced off the 200-week moving average was in July 2019, which was right before the massive run to all-time highs in gold versus commodities. Uh, so it looks like gold and silver are struggling now, but really it's all commodities across the board. I think we're in another wave of dollar rushing, and that's going to get worse as the uh, liquidity crunch comes nearer and nearer, and then it's going to become extreme. And then, of course, the Fed is going to print a whole bunch of money. And in my view, in my personal view, that should lead to the end game because it's going to be more extreme than any other time in the past, which is what happens every round of money printing is more extreme than the one before it. And this will be the last one. Could I be wrong? Yeah, this is what I think. Now moving to the silver paper markets comparing to silver squeeze. So we see here, that uh, when silver bottomed at around $16 in September 2022, I believe it was. So we've had a gently higher trending market in silver with a little bit of a triangle action here. In the blue is the silver price. In the black is the SLV holdings. Uh, so we see here that SLV holdings uh, kind of bottomed out over here 
when silver bottom then went up very very briefly but they've been down since we've hit a new low post silver squeeze this is um about 13,460 something tons uh, and it is a new post silver squeeze low so what we've seen here is that holdings have gone down and down trend lower and lower and lower as the price is trending higher since september 2022 so uh, that's showing me that interest continues to wane in the paper silver market and the demand continues to be in the physical markets. We're seeing the same thing in gold here. This chart is a little bit zoomed out, but if we look at GLD versus the GLD holdings, uh, sorry, the gold price versus the GLD holdings, the blue is the gold price. And uh, it's been trending higher also since silver bottoms, gold and silver usually bottom together around September, 2022. And now we're up significantly, but the GLD holdings keep trending down and down and down despite the rise in the gold price. Paper gold interest is also on the wane, even though the price is approaching all time highs. Silver lease rates are doing something really weird. They are up to very near all time highs that we last saw during the 2008 financial crisis. Why exactly this is happening, I don't know. It's something very derivative related. It means that silver futures prices are significantly above the spot price, which is making these rates higher. What exactly is causing it? If it's something in the derivative market, then something is imbalanced in the futures market and it's going to resolve itself somehow. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific on this, but when you see a number like this uh, and the rate is, uh, the two month rate, I believe, is as high as it was in 2008 and now it's spiked up for some reason. Something is going on in the plumbing. Don't know exactly what it's related to but it's not normal. Now we're gonna go into an argument that is happening at the Federal Reserve between different Federal Reserve governors concerning the ideal level of reserves in the banking system. There's some kind of alien sounding acronym for it. We'll get through that in a second. But the basic issue that these people don't understand, there is extra liquidity in the system. We know that right now is reverse repos and they are down about $1.6 trillion since May, 2023. Now in that time, you would expect the money supply, all other things being equal, to rise by about $1.6 trillion because you have money that was not in the monetary system, that was in the reverse repo facility, which is not counted as part of the money supply. You have that pouring into the banking system through the purchase of treasury bills, and yet the money supply is still falling. So what happened? to those $1.6 trillion. Where are they? Where, are, where have they gone? Where have all the flowers gone? The answer is they have gone into the monetary system and to counteract that, we've had debt repayment and defaulting due to high interest rates. When debt is repaid, debt that is money on the other side becomes annihilated and gets erased from the monetary system. Because the money supply has been gently falling ever since April 2022, we can infer from that that over $1.6 trillion of money has disappeared through debt repayment and default and or default. Either one, it's functionally the same for the money supply. And why can't the money supply expand now? Well, banks can't find enough people to lend the money to who would take that loan and use it for business because interest rates are too high. So if a bank can't make loans, but it could only get loans repaid, then the money supply shrinks. So the point is that once the reverse repos do run out, there will be no counteracting the actual deflation going on in the monetary system right now. And you'll start to see the money supply really plummet really fast. And it's going to lead to some kind of repocalypse or something similar. Now, here is where the Federal Reserve officials are arguing the point. This is John Williams. This guy is head of the New York Fed. That is the biggest Federal Reserve Bank in the country, the most influential Federal Reserve Bank in the country. And John Williams, I think, is the second most powerful man at the Fed. He thinks that it doesn't matter what happens to the reverse repo account. And so he says here in two paragraphs in a speech he made on January 10th at the New York Fed, uh, the FOMC said that it will continue reducing its holdings of treasury securities and agency debt and agency mortgage-backed securities as described in our framework, meaning QT will continue. He says that it is working exactly as designed and there are no signs of adverse effects on market functioning. So far, he says they have reduced the balance sheet by $1.3 trillion and there are no problems. 
What he doesn't understand is there are no problems because there's extra money flowing into the system from the RRP facility. And the second paragraph, he says, in its plans, the FOMC said that to ensure a smooth transition, it tends to slow and then stop the decline in the size of the balance sheet, meaning slow down QE when reserve balances are somewhat above the level it judges to be consistent with ample reserves. So far, we don't seem to be close to that point. So the point is here that John Williams of the New York Fed does not believe we are anywhere near close to a problem in the plumbing and QT should continue as normal at the current pace. You've also got this guy who's also a Federal Reserve Governor, Chris Waller, I think his name is, who doesn't think that it even matters what's in the reverse repo facility at all. Take it away, Chris. When we were doing QE, we were putting reserves in the system. The banks, for leverage reasons, didn't want this on their balance sheet, told their corporate customers, get it out of our banks. They had to put it somewhere. They go to money market mutual funds who say, what are we supposed to do with it? There's a shortage of treasury bills. Oh, there's the NRP. Let's give it right back to the Fed. That got up to $2 trillion, a little over $2 trillion. So I interpret that as that's $2 trillion worth of liquidity in the system that nobody needs or wants. So logic to me seemed we could pull at least $2 trillion out before we had to get serious about worrying about the level of reserves. And so far, we've pulled out somewhere in the neighborhood of, I think, one and a half, one point, I don't know the exact number, but one and a half trillion dollars and everything's fine. Do you expect the ONRRP to basically go to zero and then you'll know that that's ample? There's no reserve. reason for it to have anything in it, in, in my view. There's nothing fundamental about money being in that facility that it matters. Why is this guy wrong? Because $1.6 trillion has flowed into the monetary system, into the money supply, but the money supply is still shrinking, which means that there are enormous deflationary pressures on the money supply now. And the only thing counteracting them is this money flowing in from the RRP, which will stop once it's emptied and will start to see deflation in full effect, in full glory. And that will not last long because that will result in some kind of crisis in the plumbing. But there are arguments about this. We come to Reuters. This is an article from Reuters published on January 18th. It says, Logan, it, this is part of it. it, says Logan, Lori Logan is the head of the Dallas Fed, more of a backwater Federal Reserve Bank. Logan's remarks are a reminder that the Fed wants to avoid a repeat of 2019. She wants to slow down quantitative tightening, basically. She's on the other side of this argument. In September that year, bank reserves dropped below the l -clar. What's the l -clar? Marklar, this is Marklar. Approaching Marklar. Proceed with Marklar and make first contact. Marklar. Well, l -clar is the lowest comfortable level of reserves. I just looked that up. It's the l -clar. Needed to ensure the financial system plumbing function, repo rate shot up and the Fed was forced to all QT and inject liquidity into the banking system. That's talking about the September 2019 repocalypse. The L Clar. I come in Marklar. Oh, Mark. <laughs> is an unknowable number. It's an unknowable, ineffable pentagrammaton. <laughs> Inexpressible. Until it is breached and a moving target. You can't know what the lowest comfortable level of reserves is until something bad happens, in other words. Total bank reserves held at the Fed stand at 3.5 trillion, more than double September 2019 level at 1.4 trillion, but down from peak of 4.3 trillion. So nobody knows where the LCLAR is. It's impossible to know. Deutsche Bank US rate strategist Steven Zhang estimates that the reverse repo facility will continue falling briskly by around 450 billion in the current quarter and down to zero by June. I think it'll be quicker than that, but if it's June, fine, whatever, it doesn't make a difference. I don't see any need for concern. Fed officials mostly expect the RP to go to zero, but they will have to take greater care in monitoring liquidity conditions to avoid a repeat of 2019. Now, the final two charts I want to show you here. Do you remember these, th these charts from before 2020? These are discontinued charts, as you can see here, it says discontinued on both of them, of excess reserves. The first, they're the same chart. The first one is from 1984 to 2008, before the 2008 financial crisis. And you can see that excess reserves, excess reserves were basically total reserves in the system minus the required reserves, which is 10% that the banks are required to keep uh, to prevent bank runs and such. That's the fractional reserve ratio. And then you see this is all basically zero Right, this line over here is basically this line, which is this little bumpy, tiny, tiny little bump you see over here, is this spike you see over here. This is just zoomed in. But then you get to 2008, and you have all these excess reserves. What does excess reserves means? Excess reserves 
means that the banks can fit them on the balance sheet. They can fit them there. They're not giving them back to the Fed, but they can't loan them out. Why can't they loan them out? Because nobody wants the money because they don't want to go into higher debt. Now what's excess reserves called? They're reserves that can't even fit into the banking system at all. And so they're stuffed in something called the reverse repo facility. So if this excess reserves were still there before the RRP facility even existed in any significant way, and when the RRPs finally run out this time, they're not going to suddenly be able to loan all these standard excess reserves into the economy. So they're just going to stay at the bank and continue to earn interest at 5.3%, just as the reverse repos collect as well. Basically, what I'm saying is that once these funds run out, there will be no more extra money flooding into the monetary system. And therefore, all the deflation that is occurring now will not be counteracted by a reverse flow. And so we'll see all the deflation coming at us in full glory without any counterbalance. And that is when something is going to be triggered in the plumbing. It doesn't matter if it's in the repo markets or it's in something else, where it could be in a treasury bill auction, because maybe the banks can't buy all the treasury bills if they have a statutory leverage ratio that they have to figure out and calculate and they can't afford to put any more bonds or bills on their balance sheet. It's hard to say exactly what's going to go wrong, but something definitely is. And whatever it is and however it manifests itself, it's going to lead to the final round of printing. And that is when gold and silver are going to explode. It's going to be quick. It's going to be overnight. I don't know how much overnight, but it's not going to last very long once the final printing round gets started. And when exactly will it get started? I don't know, but it's going to be sometime close to when the RRPs run out, which will be in the next few months. My view is March. The Fed's view is June. It doesn't really matter when. It's coming. Everyone knows it. But nobody at the Fed really knows what's going to happen when it hits. Neither do I, but I'm closer to the truth than they are. This is Ralph here, the Endgame Investor, with this week's Silver Report for Arcadia Economics. The Endgame Investor is on Substack now at endgameinvestor.substack.com. Sign up there for free. And I'll see you guys next week. Mark Clark. These Marklars want to change your Marklar. They don't want this Marklar or any of his Marklars to live here because it's bad for their Marklar. Please, let these Marklars stay where they can grow and prosper without any Marklars. Marklars are Marklars!